get started. Um, welcome, Simon. Okay, there's going to be some engineering here. Trust me, I'm an engineer. <laughs> So my name is Simon, I've been doing open source for about 23 years, I was doing some free software before that, uh, I ran an OSPO, um, I made uh, uh, Unix and Java open source, um, what else have I done? <laughs> anyway, uh, now I work at uh, OSI, and um, let's, let's log into my. Yeah, yeah that's okay. Director Stefano Mafuli. It doesn't have a president anymore, which is what I did for 10 years there. Uh, it now has uh, a board that is uh, separated and distinct from it. Um, anyway, so here's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about, um, first of all, the briefest possible history of free and open source software for you. And then, I'm, in an aside, I'm going to suggest to you what it is that makes it, the dynamic of open source work, why it has taken over the software market. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, one of the problems we have from growing up. When, when you grow up, you have to pay taxes, and you have to become subject to regulation. It's one of those adult things. And unfortunately, that's coming to us as well. I was trying to retire or die before that happened, but it hasn't worked out, and so we're having to deal with it. Uh, and then we'll talk about other things. Okay. So, here's the briefest of histories of open source for you. In the beginning was the nerd. And the nerd had code, and the code was open to all. Yes. And then corporations thought making code artificially scarce was a cool way to get rich. And then some guy defined a way to stop that happening. And quite a lot of people thought that it was quite clever. And thus was introduced the term digital sovereignty. Digital sovereignty, just like socialism, is a cleaned up word for Christianity. <laughs> so digital sovereignty is a cleaned up word for free software. And so every time you hear someone from the government talking about digital sovereignty, just remind yourself what they're talking about is that thing you do. They're talking about. They don't know it, they may need the, the, just the lines joining up for them, but that's what they're talking about. Um, so, a little bit of the dynamic of how that all came about. Oh, <laughs> I see the approach. Who tells me the mic is interfered with. I'm not even wearing the Madonna. I'll use this one, okay. Oh, oh, that's on now, yes, definitely. So, um, free software was a brilliant idea. Um, it was, however, the product of an era when the internet was not ubiquitous. Uh, it was the product of an era, it, it arose from a conflict over the distribution of magnetic tapes containing uh, a text editor. 
And um, by the time we got to the late 1990s, um, a, a culture had formed around it, and, and there, you could say there were some, social, so, some problems socialising it with companies. And so uh, one of the things that happened is a, a group of people uh, added the idea of uh, the phrase open source, and more importantly, they added a way to produce what I'm going to explain is called a stochastic confidence in, in developers. Now, that change to using the term open source, if you're an English speaker, was something that happened 25 years ago. So 40 years ago, Richard Stallman got angry with his printer. 25 years ago, open source was defined, and we started to move into the, the, the general use of software in the, uh, in the world. And so, I, I think this counts as mature. I mean, I have to tell you, looking out of the audience, that you're not as young as you used to be. <laughs> uh, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. <laughs> so, mature things get regulated, I'm afraid. And so I'm going to let you guess what happens next while we go and talk about something else. So now, why did open source work? Why, why, why did that happen? Uh, now, I'm going to assert that open source worked. And the reason I'm going to assert that is because around about 80% of all software now depends on or is completely open source software. And uh, around about 100 billion euros of GDP is driven in Europe by open source software. I'm going to suggest that open source has uh, taken the control point of the software market. And as a consequence of that, that's why I think it's going to get regulated, because the software market's about to get regulated, and so consequently so is open source, whether we want it or not. So why did open source work? It's because of something that I call stochastic confidence. So by confidence, what I mean is that software freedom is that idea that, that uh, RMS came up with. It ensures that all of the, uh, the uses that allow someone to enjoy software are expressly granted in advance through a software license. And by granting those, uh, those rights expressly in advance, what I mean is um, that the right to enjoy the software, enjoy means use it, improve it, share it, monetize it, uh, that was never in the original Four Freedoms, which was a shame, because it's there in the manifesto, and by not putting it in the Four Freedoms, we've allowed a lot of people to think that uh, free and open source software always has to be something that is done for love only. And I think that's a mistake, so I've put monetized back in the Four Freedoms. Uh, you can enjoy it for any purpose. You can enjoy it in any place. <laughs> Unlike <laughs> about here, yeah, that's good. Um, you, you have all of the necessary rights to enjoy the soft software in any combination with other software, as a subset or as a superset, and you have those rights whether you're part of the community that is maintaining it or not. You, if you are an unknown other person about to take. Uh, one-tenth of the code of a piece of open source software and do something completely new with it, you, you have all the freedoms necessary to do that. One big mistake we make is we assume people want our code because they think our code is great. Often they want our code because only part of it is great. And we need to make sure we always have that. Maybe not here. But there are shades of grey. So developers want confidence, they have those freedoms. <laughs> so all of these freedoms, they're, they're not, you can try that one as well. <laughs> How's that one? Yeah, there we go. Okay. Um, when you see software under a software license, 
it may be that you don't want to give other people the benefit of the same freedoms you had yourself. I worked with a group of people at a company called Ford Drop once, who got hold of some software under an open source license and decided they didn't really want other people to have the same freedoms. You may want that, that liberty. Um, maybe you, um, you, you prefer not to have to give attribution to the authors of the software. Those are two of the sets of conditions that you find in open source licenses that people object to and want to work around. And so um, one of the questions you have that takes away from your certainty about whether you can use a particular piece of software is you look at the license and you're not sure it gives you all the freedoms that you want. Um, now, there are many licenses out there and uh, wise or not, whatever it is you want to do, there's a license for that. Uh, can't guarantee wisdom, can guarantee there's a license. Uh, but the licenses that OSI has defined definitely give you software freedom, whether it's wise for you to use them in other ways or not. We're not there to tell you whether you are making a wise decision. We're simply telling you whether you are free to make that foolish decision. And so, uh, the reason we feel that that needs to happen is not every developer has access to legal counsel. And more importantly, people with access to legal counsel might not want to ask. And so, why did open source succeed? Well, open source succeeded because it created stochastic confidence. It gave sufficient people sufficient confidence that they could use the code they needed for that to become uh, the reality of them choosing software for their projects. Um, they discovered that when they used software under OSI approved licenses, that there was a very low probability of needing to go get further permission. There are still uncertainties, but not enough of them to poison the network effect that becomes a growing open source community. And so the thing that made open source work was, was not the main thing that you might think of. It, it was actually that license discuss mailing list that OSI runs. Because everyone's got the freedom to go to that mailing list and discuss every new open source license, you can quickly see which ones are problematic to the overall community. It doesn't matter that not everyone has commented because the mailing list isn't big enough for everyone to comment. What matters is that anyone who has got a problem with the license has had a chance to say so. And licenses that make it through that public filter and get added to the approved licenses list by OSI give sufficient stochastic confidence for a community to join, to, to form around the license. And that, that was the secret source that made free software turn into a hundred billion dollar, a hundred billion euro movement in Europe. That tiny thing, giving people sufficient stochastic confidence. Um, I need to talk just briefly about permissive. Um, I'm not very happy with people calling licenses permissive. I need to tell you people, all open source licenses are permissive licenses. Okay? Because a permissive license is a license that is not restrictive. It gives you permission to use improve, share, and monetize the software. Now, however, all licenses have conditions. Some of those conditions say you've got to credit the authors. Some of those conditions say you have to make available the full corresponding source code. There are other conditions which are uh, sufficiently uh, obscure that I probably are not aware of them unless you are in a community that depends on one of those licenses. So, by um, looking through those licenses and crystallizing the, the terms, what we've done is create uh, a level playing field where you don't need a lawyer to have sufficient confidence to proceed with your project. Some people will need just that little bit of advice, but enough people won't for a community to form. So what breaks open source? Well, what will break open source is anything that lowers the stochastic confidence level below the point where the network effect can take place. 
And what can do that? What can lower that stochastic confidence level? Well, the, one of the big things is software patterns. Uh, software patterns are alive and well, and they're present in all of the de jure standards that anyone ever wants to implement. Uh, if you ever look at a standard that has come from Etsy or Senselec or a number of other bodies, there is a very strong probability it comes associated with what are called standard essential patents. That's to say, patents that are essential to the implementation of the standard. Um, actually, any form of compliance certification is likely to lower the stochastic confidence level. Uh, so, needing to prove where the software came from, knowing someone's going to ask you, that lowers the stochastic confidence level. Developer certification, particularly, particularly ICLAs, contributor license agreements are a great way to lower the stochastic confidence level and damage a community. DRM is a great way to make people unhappy. I don't think that's universally true though. Um, geographic embargo is the stochastic confidence level. So at the moment, having to exclude people from Russia from your community is, is, a, is a big issue. There's a lot of people who don't want to do that. I would encourage you to be very thoughtful about that issue because it's a very difficult issue. Uh, and I would point out that if you're part of a community that has a substantial number of people in North America, they are likely to get into very, very serious trouble with their government if they tolerate contributions from Russian nationals in the project. And you may not be aware of that. So be nice to your friends over, overseas. And then license term uncertainty. Any license where you're not quite sure if you have software freedom will lower the stochastic confidence level. Now, guess what? All of those things are busily happening at the moment. And um, so, hello, regulation. Uh, now, where does all the regulation come from? I have to tell you, there has been a tidal wave of regulation from the European Union recently. I'm going to show you a slide in a minute that names some of it. I sat down and tried to remember all the pieces of legislation that were currently in flight, and I couldn't. I, I filled a page and I thought, oh, that's enough. You'll see it in a minute. Uh, so, where does it all come from? It's come from the fact that the European Union has lots of products on the consumer and business to business market have digital elements in them. That's what they call software. And products with digital elements are now the dominant controlling force in many market sectors. And where the products themselves have got uh, consumer safety concerns, they get regulated and the same has to be <laughs> okay, um, I should probably put that somewhere so that the video can be in. Okay. Um, so, if products uh, need regulating, what's going to happen is we're going to see uh, more and more documents coming out that refer to products with digital elements. I mean, after all, as I said earlier, open source represents a big slice of money in the European Union now. Uh, it's 80% of the software market. It's worth at least 100 billion euros, according to a European Union survey. That's not a made-up number. That's, that comes from, from some research that was funded by the European Union. And so, no matter what we do, open source is going to get regulated. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't stop it. It is an oncoming train. So the question is, how do we make sure that the regulation that affects us is informed and is intentional? Difficult question. So let's have a think about some unintended consequences. Uh, the regulation that's emerging today is unfortunately not sufficiently informed and intentional. Um, it, the way that it's been framed risks introducing those additional permission steps that break open source by lowering the stochastic confidence level. 
those collateral effects of the, the regulation risk turning open source into proprietary software development with a hierarchical management system and a waterfall process. Because that is what was in the heads of the people writing the legislation. And so their regulatory checkpoints all fit a closed process with hierarchical management and a waterfall release process. Uh, now, I would, I would suggest that's not good. Uh, that does not seem to have uh, grasped the importance of communities co-developing software being at the heart of the European economy. More importantly, it doesn't seem to be intentional damage. So for the Cyber Resilience Act, I went to speak to the author of the Cyber Resilience Act, and he assured me that open source software was completely protected by the terms of the Cyber Resilience Act. He believes that he has completely excluded all of our communities from the scope of the Cyber Resilience Act. Now that comes as news to all of our communities, because we read the Cyber Resilience Act, and it doesn't look like we're terribly excluded at the moment. Yes, he has excluded uh, non-commercial software, but who here works on non-commercial software? <laughs> Yeah, there's one person over there, but we possibly can speak up this, because I don't think it's possible you might not. <laughs> you see, we discovered quite a long time ago, a guy called David Wheeler, who now works for the Linux Foundation, um, established that all software is commercial software, potentially. That is to say, it is, of a, it is licensed in such a way, and it is of a quality that is suitable for use in commerce. It can be placed on the market. Now, whether or not it is, is beside the point. All open source software is potentially commercial. You cannot differentiate between commercial open source and non-commercial open source. Now, there was a nasty accident that happened during the impact assessment of the CRA. The impact assessors read a paper by a well-known German academic who uses the term uh, commercial software, and they misunderstood him as saying that you could differentiate between commercial and non-commercial uses. And so on that basis, the CRA used that as the sole test for excluding open source. Um, so that's an example. The insight of the people who were writing the act was too narrow to understand the effects on communities that were outside their immediate view. Their conceptual model was not adequate for understanding the systemic uh, effects of open source software. And um, worst of all, the legislative timelines for all of this legislation are accelerated. The European Union has come up with a new legislative framework that means they believe they now need a much shorter review period for new legislation. So we first saw the text for the CRA just after Christmas, and it's going to be passed by the European Parliament before the autumn. That's not sufficient time for us to engage. Uh, added to which, the people they have been speaking to who claim to be our friends may not be completely our friends. Now, that sounds like kind of vague and funny, so let me give you a concrete example. Uh, I think it's a Swedish company, so that you could uh, enjoy this. So we were reading the attachments to a submission to the European Union uh, around about uh, 18 months ago. And we discovered that uh, on one of the pages of that submission, Ericsson has asked the European Union to treat open source software as a modality of antitrust. They want you to believe that collaborating over software is something which should be considered to be antitrust unless it is regulated to prevent that from happening. In other words, Ericsson, which is a sponsor, it's a, it's a board member of the Linux Foundation and of the Eclipse Foundation, it is a sponsor of many conferences. It has an open source program office. And yet, it is lobbying the European Union 
to have open source uh, completely regulated to the point where it will be impossible for anybody to work on it without going through a rigorous or regular compliance regular check and process. Uh, and now I've picked on them because I found them. Okay. But I have a high degree of confidence that a lot of other corporations that say they are our friends are doing exactly the same stuff. So we cannot rely on corporations proxying for us. It, it would be good if we could. And we cannot rely on trade associations proxying for us. You know that there are different kinds of non-profits in the open source world. There are organizations like, I don't know, Python Foundation, uh, like the, the uh, Apache Software Foundation. They are public charities. Their bylaws say they serve the general public. There are other organizations like the Eclipse Foundation and the Linux Foundation that are trade associations. They are member associations and their bylaws say they, tr they exist to serve their members. So it's not obvious to me that we can even rely on trade associations to advocate for us. Because, well, Linux Foundation and Eclipse Foundation have both got Eclipse on, they've both got Ericsson on their board, who are lobbying to have a free day. So what are we going to do about that? That doesn't sound very good to me. I don't know about you. Okay, so now let's look at the, look at the problems. Brief break. Um, here is the stuff I'm attempting to... Uh, so the Cyber Resilience Act is a, a piece of legislation that makes it a requirement that uh, manufacturers who are putting a product with digital elements on the market in the European Union put a CE mark on their product to indicate that it complies with all necessary consumer regulations. And then the Cyber Resilience Act defines what those consumer re regulations are for a product with digital elements. And basically, it, the basic statement is you can't ship something with an exploitable vulnerability. That's, the, that's your, 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 your kind of one-line summary. Goes a bit further than that, 72 pages, but that's your kind of one-line summary. Um, Cyber Resilience Act creates a duty or a set of responsibilities for your company. And then the Product Liability Directive update is updating Europe's product liability rules so that uh, people who fail to uh, live up to their responsibilities under the Cyber Resilience Act are liable for significant, significant damages. And that is following on just about, about a month behind the CRA. Um, I, 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 I don't know if I put it on a later slide. I should explain there's two kinds of instruments that we're looking at here. The ones that end in an act are also sometimes called a regulation. And they are union-wide law that becomes effective as soon as the parliament passes it. And the things that end with a D that are directives, and they are a framework for law, which each country has individually then got to implement in their national law. So the Cyber Resilience Act will be on the statute books by the end of this year. I have absolutely no doubt that that is what's going to happen, because it's being treated by parliament as a Think of the children grade piece of legislation. And you know that nothing can stop a think of the children grade. <coughs> um, then also, there's the Digital Markets Act. Digital Markets Act is uh, an act that, among other things, breaks open Apple and Google's walled gardens <coughs> and uh, forces them to interoperate, interoperate with small platforms. Good news for Android. Uh, it also forces chat applications to be interoperable if they are run by what are called gatekeeper platforms. So that's good use for signal. Um, so digital ones, not all bad stuff. Some of this stuff is quite good stuff. Uh, the AI Act is going to regulate um, critical AI. Uh, it is still in a great deal of turbulent change at the moment. So exactly who it affects is your, your guess is as good as mine. And your guess is probably better because I haven't really been paying attention. Uh, the Interoperable Europe Act is coming down the pipe. It's going to tell all European administrations that their systems have to be interoperable across borders. And so you will be able to use the same app to ticket your journey from Gothenburg to Barcelona on the train. Uh, the standard essential patent regulation 
and it's coming down the pipe. That's going to change the rules for standard essential patterns. It's actually possibly quite good news. Uh, it's hard to tell. The Data Act is also out there. And there's more. I mean, there's, there's more. Every time I, I get an email from the Commission, it's another act. There's a, there's a consultation on networking in the digital age. There is a consultation. Well, I mean, there's loads of these things. They are all just cascading out of the Commission at the moment. So now, all of those instruments that I've described to you there have a direct, indirect, or collateral impact on open source. All of them do. And uh, the maintenance and use of open source software is going to be uh, touched by all of those changes. And that is going to change the world that you develop in. Uh, now, that's a big problem because the European Commission forgot to ask us. While the European Commission went out of its way to visit small and medium enterprises in their offices, the European Commission did not make the slightest attempt to contact any open source public clarity to ask whether anything they were doing might cause impact to that 100 billion euro GDP segment in their market. They just kind of overlooked it. They forgot to do it. They thought that asking some people from Fraunhofer Institute was sufficient. Basically, that's the basic so It's a bit bigger than that, actually. But they thought that was, a, that was enough. You know, the European Commission doesn't even have a mechanism to consult with open source communities. And the reason for that is because open source communities are a form of what is called the fourth sector. Um, go look it up. It's quite interesting. If, you're, if I'm boring you yet, go look up the fourth sector. It's quite interesting. Uh, the fourth sector is the emergent sector of the community that has been in enabled and brought about by the ubiquity of the internet. It allows individuals to play roles that in the past only corporations could play. Uh, roles in manufacturing, distribution, financing. Those roles can now be played by individuals. There's individuals around here who have done that, who have started out as an individual, started a software project, and, well, in many cases, it's grown into a, into a multinational corporation. In some cases, it's ended up being, I'm sorry. So the European Commission doesn't even have a mechanism with which to talk to us. Um, it is completely asleep when it comes to the issue of talking to fourth sector organizations. So now, let's assume that they did get a will to talk to us. What would we do about it? Well, um, yes, okay, the, the general issue of the fourth sector being underrepresented does need fixing. But it's more of a problem for us than for many other fourth sector categories. Um, first of all, our community is a community of communities of communities. We have within our number many different motivations for participating in open source. Some of those motivations are economic, some of them are social, some of them are intellectual, some of them are academic, <coughs> some of them are an inscrutable mix of all of those things that changes from day to day. And the people who work on software, probably you, are all very different. That may come as a surprise to you, you may feel all the same today. But actually, our global community is very diverse, uh, along many different diversity axes. <clears throat> um, the second problem we have is we suffer from uh, that life of Brian syndrome. Uh, the, the problem with the, um, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, Judean people, popular front and the popular front of Judea. <coughs> it turns out that the more we agree, the more vigorous we, vigorously we disagree about less. And this is a representational problem. When you bring a group of open source people together to talk about these policies, it's actually extremely easy for us to find things to disagree about. And um, that, that makes it very hard to, to go and look, go and speak to regulators. They say, well, the guy that came in just now said the only way we could do this was by talking to Richard Stallman. Uh, and now you're telling me the only way we can do this 
is to make sure that the BSD license is mandated by the European Union. You know, which of you is talking for open source, they say. And we actually heard that after FOSDEM, when the creators of the CRA came on stage for the plenary. Uh, we asked, somebody went up and asked them, you know, why don't you talk to us? And the response we got was, well, we, we're never sure who we're talking to. We never thought who you're speaking for. So our community includes within it horizontal and vertical public charities, trade associations, unincorporated associations, that's things where there's no legal entity, there's just a group of people who are hoping that no one ever asks them who owns the trademark. Uh, there are fascinating mixtures of these things that have, you know, they've got a public charity, but they, they haven't actually assigned any of the code to it, and they, the copyright, the, sorry, the trademark belongs to the guy that started the project, but there's also a public charity. That was kind of my SQL. Um, and there's a few individual contributors who have significant voice. And uh, they show up at the European Parliament as well. So that's a very exciting landscape. Now, can it be done? Can we represent open source at the European Parliament? Yes, we can. We did it successfully in 2005 when a diverse group of people with different views of the world each went to the Parliament and addressed the Parliament in their own different ways. There were some people who were taking boats onto the river outside the Strasbourg Parliament with banners on them. There were some people inflating tanks, uh, uh, inflatable tanks on the grass outside the European Parliament in Brussels. There were some people who were visiting every MEP, uh, office by office, to explain to them that interoperability was more important than patent applicability. <coughs> Everyone contributed in their own way. Many people coordinated with each other, and we did it. We, 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 we persuaded Parliament not to pass the Software Patent Directive. So that's very encouraging. It is possible. What would it look like if we did it again? So this may sound familiar. Uh, we need to coordinate. Coordination between organisations is something which is very important. And yes, we're already doing that. European open source organisations are meeting on a phone call once a month now to talk about upcoming policy. We need to segment. So for the CRA, we have a specific project about the CRA that helps us to focus on what needs to be done next. Mentoring is um, some organisations actually have professional staff whose job it is to do policy analysis and, and they help, they guide us, they tell us when we're completely crazy. Uh, they, sometimes they're, they're very gentle and kind telling us that we're completely crazy and uh, other times they throw their body across the door to stop us leaving. Um, there's peer review. We share our position papers. We make sure that uh, everyone is on board with things. So, where's, where's, is Alexander here? Alexander Sander? He's, he's, he's gone to the room downstairs. So, Alex from FSFE and I from OSI may sound strange companions, but we share our position papers with each other to make sure that we're not going to piss each other off when they are submitted to the European Parliament, because that would be a bad thing to do. Because to the European Parliament, we are all one community. And um, inclusiveness. So this isn't just for pros. This is something that turns everyone into a pro when they join in. Now the reason I said did that sound familiar, that's basically an open source community. That's the dynamics of an open source community. And so that's what we have done. We have learned our lesson from the Software Patent Directive and we are organizing not in the way that other organizations organize with rigid hierarchies and committees and, and uh, guerrilla action and so on. But in an open source way, with mentoring and collaboration and segmentation. Now you can help with this. Um, there's a number of ways you can help. One of the best ways you can, you can help is to check if you're part of an open source organization, whether your organization is affiliated with OSI. If it has, that organisation can ask me to represent you and to hear your view on the legislation and I can feed that into these conversations and also represent you when I'm visiting Brussels 
Strasbourg and other places. Uh, you may not want OSI to do that, you might prefer FSFE to do that. <coughs> so go, go talk to Matthias in the room downstairs and ask him whether they, FSFE will look after your representation needs. And if you don't like either of us, well, there's other places to go. I can't quite think what they are at the moment. <laughs> um, check if your community is already part of our coordinated effort. Um, if your community is already part of that coordinated effort, find out who the coordinator is and whether they need some help. Uh, be the contact point in your organization for sign on for open letters. Around the Cyber Resilience Act, we have published around about four open letters now. And each of them has been signed by multiple organizations across Europe. We've tried to make sure that the signatures on those are from actual practitioner open source community members rather than from corporations. Because as I suggested earlier, you can never quite be sure if you endorse a corporate spokesperson for your uh, organization. <coughs> uh, you can represent your community on a monthly call. Um, if you have the time, maybe come and engage directly. You can engage directly in Stockholm as well as engaging directly in Brussels or, or in the uh, legislative location of your choice. Um, we need to touch both the central organization of the European Union in Brussels and Strasbourg and also the national representatives on council and then in the national parliaments as directives are transposed into national law. If you want to work on that, we will tell you how to do that. Um, we will give you an excuse to go for a, a, a week's break or just a couple of days break. Yeah. City breaks, everyone wants a city break. Who wouldn't want a city break visiting a legislator as well? <laughs> and consider writing to your MEP. If, unlike me, you are lucky enough to be a European citizen, you will have an MEP, and you should write to them and tell them how you feel about the difficulty of cons consultation of fourth sector organisations and the collateral damage that European legislation is going to do to open source. Write to them. They need to hear from you. Write in nice, easy language. Try to avoid using any jargon. If that's too hard, ask, and somebody will give you a letter that they have sent to their MEP for you to read and study. Because we're all into mentoring and collaboration on that area as well. So, I don't want to be a bearer of just of bad news. I think we can make a difference here. I think we can make sure that free and open source software has a voice. But the people who will speak up are actually not me or the employees of big organizations, but almost certainly you. Um, the organizations that claim to be our friends have many, many employees in Brussels visiting the commission every day. Some of those organizations <coughs> that are more likely to be our friends, like Red Hat, have got a team of people who are going and visiting MEPs around CRA. But if we're going to have an impact, the people who will do that are, well, us. Just like the people who will have an impact with our code are us. And so I invite you to consider your role in making sure that the future of open source is a future that is still characterized by software freedom for everyone, and not software freedom uh, uh, as long as the regulator lets <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, we have around five minutes for Q&A. If anyone wants to, I see hands raised. <laughs> So, how can a, reg a, a regulation that renders a hundred billions worth of software useless can hold waters? Um, okay. So, I've heard people asking, saying, haven't I noticed that the end of the license has got a lot of words in big capital letters that say there are no warranties? 
And uh, my legal friends have pointed out to me that you can't contractually obligate, you, uh, exclude yourself from the duty not to commit crimes. And uh, so it doesn't really matter how big the letters are, or what colour you put them in, or what words you phrase it in, you can't disclaim your duty to protect European citizens under the Cyber Resilience Act. And so when you see those warranty disclaimers, those warranty disclaimers are, um, they're, they, they're missing a word usually, it's, it's usually, or oh, missing a couple of words, they're missing the concept of as far as legally possible. You cannot have a warranty disclaimer that lets you break the law, unfortunately. Because I'd quite like one, it would be very handy. <laughs> Any yeah? more questions? There's one down here. You can't hide that the first row. <laughs> Florian has his own mic, he could use. Yeah. <laughs> so, the, the initiatives you presented or the, the acts you, you are reacting to, that seems to be mostly reactive, right? Yes. Is there also um, initiatives or um, movements to, to proactively uh, push or um, initiate uh, legislation or regulation that would support open source or are we coming from a utopia where everything really worked great and we're just trying to lock in the wind that we already have? Okay, so, so we are largely in a situation where we are reactive unfortunately. Um, that is because um, the legislative environment assumes that everybody who's going to be affected has got an office in Brussels that has got full-time staff who are reading the bulletins uh, so, uh, if, if you want to see the problem, the European Union will let you subscribe to new, uh, new instrument bulletins. I get one every day, and it has got like three pages of new activities every day. And they are all described in a, an interesting bureaucraties that makes it impossible to find out whether they've read on open source without downloading the 72-page PDF. And skimming through it to see whether they're... You can't even search for open source um, because uh, often the impacts don't... Ex they don't know they're causing harm. So they don't say they're causing harm. So to be proactive, we need to do much more monitoring. Now, one great thing we could do as a community is to have, you know... I know that there are nerds here who like reading laws. And you, you know, I mean, I know there are. I've met you. Uh, we could scan all this stuff collaboratively between us and work out and get really early warning of what's coming down the pipe. Then we've got to start from resource it. So when these things happen, they come out with a consultation. The consultation often isn't keen to warn people in civil society or full sector organisations, so the alert hasn't gone out to us. When the consultation comes up, it's often a questionnaire and you read through and it's asking, like the software patent directive one, the questionnaire has got lots of questions about, you know, how many software patents do you have and how much money do you make from them and how terrible would it be for you to stop being able to make that money in. And there's no box for me to write in, my community can't implement your standard because of the SEPs. That there isn't a box in the questionnaire for that. So being proactive is, a, is something that I think is very desirable. Um, the first step that I'm taking on that is to talk about this fourth sector issue. Because I think that there are people in the European Union who will, who are very concerned that the fourth sector is not consulted. Um, if you look at the amendments to the CRA that came out of a parliamentary committee, they talk about micro-enterprise. They inserted language about micro-enterprise. There are clearly MEPs who are concerned about this issue and they're using that as their token word to talk about the fourth sector. Uh, so I'm going to press on that issue proactively and try and get the consultation environment opened up to people who don't have a Brussels office. Uh, actually, we do have a Brussels office for the free software movement um, because uh, we, we do have, we, we can draw on Open Forum Europe who have an office there. And then we also have an Amsterdam office because NLNet has got an office and is directly engaging on these subjects. So things are getting better. In the react on the reactive side, but doing the proactive side is going to be much more challenging, I think. 
question back there. Yeah, let's make that a quick one, because then we need some time for people to be able to move about. <laughs> So in all these acts and regulations that you listed, is there, are they all bad? Or is there something good in any of them for open source? There's some good things. Uh, let's see. Can we go back? Uh, so um, the, the NIST 2 directive isn't on that list. So NIST 2 directive is a directive to create a harmonized uh, digital environment across Europe. Um, and it does talk about mandating open source, and it does talk about how you use open source. Um, because it was written by people who don't have a full, full, you know, 360 degree understanding of the community, it unfortunately does harm as well. Um, but because it's a directive, we can fix that as it gets transposed into national law in each jurisdiction in Europe. So that's the current order of play on this too. Um, the SEP regulation, I'm a big fan of. Um, uh, it doesn't do any material harm to open source. Uh, it does, however, do material harm to patent pools and could allow us to finally stop having uh, AV1 and other uh, codex um, SEP'd out of existence by corporations uh, being proxied through shady patent pool and lobbying organisations. So I'm quite a fan of that one. Interoperable Europe Act, we don't know yet, we haven't seen it yet, so pff, who knows. It, I mean, it, it ought to be good for open source because the obvious way to be interoperable is open interfaces, open data formats and open source reference implementations. So that, that one could be good. Cyber Resilience Act is actually essential. I mean, it's really important that we protect European citizens from, uh, from malicious products or products with malicious elements in them. So it's a thoroughly good thing. It's just that it, it hasn't, the person that wrote it thought all software was made secretly inside a corporation in a hierarchical management structure around with a waterfall release process. And so all of their checkpoints all regulate that hierarchical management and that, that waterfall release process. And if we have to fit open source in, well, it doesn't quite fit because we don't have a hierarchical management structure. And, we don't really use waterfall anymore because it's not a very good idea there. Um, so yes, there's good things in there, and because I'm spending all of my day reading the, uh, you know, I, I look at my email and it says CRA in the subject line, and I, I go, you know, what fresh hell is this coming into my mailbox? And so I overlook the good parts because we don't have to complain about the good parts. So consequently, I don't look at them. Thank you.